Welcome to the HCI Family of Podcasts, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We share our own original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. Join us for practitioner-oriented content around all things leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with the HCI family of podcasts. Dr. Carrie Graham, welcome to the conversation today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, John. I appreciate it. I'm excited um, and looking forward to where our conversation goes. Me too. Thank you so much for joining me. You're joining me from uh, the North Carolina area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about adult learning and how we can improve adult learning initiatives within our organizations. Now, we know that there are major skills gaps uh, in the labor force, uh, for a variety of reasons. There's a, a wide number of, of causes behind that. But the, the reality is that we have skills gaps and the nature of work is shifting rapidly. Technological advances uh, are being thrown at us constantly. And so the, the need for constant reskilling and upskilling is as high as it's ever been. And we need to develop cultures of learning within our organizations. And I think most leaders would agree to everything I just said. <laughs> They'd say, yeah, Absolutely. We, we, we would need to do that. The problem is most, most organizations aren't very good at it. Um, they, they either don't have good in-house um, uh, training programs or they try to pull in, you know, off the shelf stuff from outside. And sometimes it fits their needs. Sometimes it doesn't. It's often very expensive. Uh, and so anyways, we're going to unpack this, explore this and try to think through what it means to have really great adult learning for our workforce, uh, given the current context and where we're going in, in the future of work. As we get started, I wanted to share Carrie's bio with everybody. Carrie Graham cares about your employees and clients. She's an adult learning strategist and training consultant who helps businesses improve learning engagement, information retention, and skill application. Dr. Graham turns adult learning and workplace learning theories into practical strategy to improve trainings in your organizations. And that's why she's on the show today. Again, great to have you, Carrie. Anything you would like to add by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? I think it's important for people to um, understand that I actually come from healthcare. So my, my first degrees are in healthcare. I worked as a clinician for a number of years and then transitioned to being a faculty member for two decades, over two decades. And that's really where, you know, when people say, how did the next question is always, well, how did you arrive at doing this body of work? Mm -hmm. And it really, as a healthcare provider, you are tasked and I was tasked with asking really cr critical questions, looking very carefully at the situation, quickly developing an effective solution to that, right? That's the healthcare part of it. But then the curriculum development for two decades, you know, developing courses that meet, that provide students an opportunity to learn knowledge and skills but that meet a national certification, it's not yeah. an easy undertaking. And so that's the, the path in which I've journeyed. And, and I was always searching for that one more thing. But honestly, John, I, I realized that in my during my doctoral work and learning about adult learning and workplace learning, that's when the fire grew inside of me and, and realizing that there's so many opportunities for us to improve the experience of, of employees. Yes, absolutely. And my background in the HR space as a practitioner was first in training and development. Um, and, and so my, my first love was in teaching and in, tra you know, doing training programs. Uh, and then I was pulled into academia as well, uh, where I've been for the last uh, close to 20 years now. Um, so I don't have a healthcare background, but it sounds like we have, you know, kind of similar, you know, journeys in in some ways at least. And may, maybe I'll start with a couple kind of terms that probably most people have heard of, maybe don't fully understand. We often talk in the higher ed space, even in the training and development space um, and learning and development space within organizations. We talk about pedagogy. Uh, yeah. We talk about pedagogy, um, but there's this other term that some people 
aren't fully aware of called andragogy, right. uh, which is kind of the adult learning side of pedagogy. Now right. we, te- we tend to use the terms interchangeably as practitioners. Oftentimes, um, you know, I, oftentimes people are talking, say the word pedagogy when they're talking about adult learners, they mean andragogy. It, it doesn't really matter. I, you know, I don't want to be a, uh, someone calling out the, the wrong term or something like that. Um, but just as a, as a, as a level set at the very beginning, those are two common terms and andragogy really is specifically around adult learning theory, specifically learning for adults. How do adults learn? How do, how do you motivate them in their learning? How do you help them apply their skills? That's what it's all about. So I think that's what we're going to really tackle today. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. You're right. So many organizations and individuals are using the language of pedagogy and what I, it it is in fact, the inaccurate language. However, when you look at, and I think you can appreciate this, John, when you look at the way in which people conduct trainings, They conduct it from the perspective of pedagogy. When you work with children, I talk about them as empty slates. And Mm -hmm. so you're teaching and you're providing and filling them up. And that's really the perspective that I think that we see so often in the workplace right now, as opposed to when we think about adults and adult learning, the andragogy aspect of it, the focus there is recognizing that adults have life experience that they incorporate in their current learning experience. And with that, they're not empty slates. They yeah. have their own mental models. They have their own ideas about, you know, whatever the topic is. And so I encourage people to take that, take that shift when you're creating um, a training and development in the workplace. It's recognizing that you, your people don't have an empty slate, even if they haven't worked in your organization before, or if they're transitioning into a new industry, they still have existing skills and experiences that they can draw from and apply in this situation. Yeah. And of course, we always want to meet people where they're at for training to be effective. You're trying to identify a gap and you're trying to fill that gap and bridge to where, you know, the, the skill needs to be for, to have the performance that you want to have. And so that means by definition, you have to meet them where they're at. Otherwise you're going to have a bridge that connects to the wrong place. Right. <laughs> and it's gonna, you know, uh, you know, so if if you think about it in those terms, like the bridge to nowhere, the, the, the comical, you know, political, um, uh, anecdote that, you know, sometimes we point to, um, you don't want, you know, a training bridge to nowhere. You, you, you yeah. have to, you have to have clear connection from the people where they're at to where you want them to go. Uh, right. and, and absolutely. When you're talking about those in the workforce, they have a lifetime of experience, uh, even young people, Gen Z and young millennials, uh, and, and I mean, even even really young Gen Z who are entering the workforce, they have experiences. So Thank tap you. into those. It, it only makes for better learning and application when you can connect back to where they're at, what they know, um, understand the mental models, understand the biases and the assumptions that may be being made. Uh, sometimes yeah. sometimes you have to help people unlearn some things to, to yeah. build, you know, to break it down to foundational points to where you can build you know, firmly. So all right. of this, I think it's, it's a really great point that you highlight from the outset, because um, mm-hmm. oftentimes that gets missed uh, when, that when is. I see, when I see organizations trying to put forward uh, training programs. Yeah, it, it does. And, and that is actually where I start when I, when I'm working with clients is I always ask them, it is the first conversation we have is, well, who is your end user? And mm-hmm. Without fail, every client I've ever worked with has rattled off demographic information. Oh, they're managers. They are, you know, this generation, blah, blah, blah. And and I sit and I listen because it's information. But the reality is, is that's like, that's where they're stopping. And so Mm -hmm. I, I take them further and say, okay, that's great. But who are they as learners? Let's identify that. Because if we can understand that element of who they are and what they potentially bring to the table or not, we can then build from there. And it's it's really interesting that once I start having a conversation with people around 
looking at your end user through the adult learning lens, the, I can see the light bulbs going on. And, and without fail, they always say, I haven't thought of it in that regard, or I recognize mm -hmm. like they're able to see the gaps in the, in the training, training effectiveness and efficiency as well. So let's, let's talk more now about some of those other elements of andragogy that may be a bit different than what people typically think of when they think about pedagogy or teaching children. Yeah. 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 Do you have a question specifically um, you want me to tell so, it? Yeah. So I would, I would just love to, to hear your thoughts on that. So what, what are some of the things you see most commonly within organizations? Uh, you've already identified, you know, the, the, the importance of the understanding people are on a blank slate, tapping yeah. into their experiences. Yeah. Um, what are some of those other key points that you find to be most salient? Yeah, I, I would also argue at, at this time in 2024, because we all globally are, you know, a very short period removed from a pandemic. We've got multiple generations in the workforce. The way in which the workplace looks is rapidly evolving and changing. And yeah. because of that, the individuals are experiencing rapid evolution of their social roles. Now, what I mean by social roles, you know, just to be clear, is during the pandemic, during the shutdowns, I should say, we have had so many, I, I can't even count, individuals who are working parents, but now they're working parents at home with their children and becoming um, participants in their children's education. We also have individuals who, um, given middle age and even younger, are caring for aging relatives. People's social role has significantly changed, and that, in fact, has an impact on their ability to work, their capacity, their motivation. So if an employer is putting together, you know, I need everyone to come on site, we're going to have a day-long training session. It may be the best training session available, but you are not attending to the needs of the individuals you want there, your employees. Um, and so and, that- And can I also say, it's probably not the best training ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's I mean, not. Almost, all, almost always, you're going to have people scratching their heads. Why did I have to come in for this all day? Could this not have been a one hour thing or- could it have been an email? Could right? it have like, been an email? <laughs> right. So I would say it's it's the recognizing that that adults are experiencing changing social roles. Um, I, I have a I was talking to a colleague and I was sharing with them how you may have a team of individuals, but each of the those team members are at different phases of their life. So you've got someone who's straight out of like they're new to industry, new to their profession. They're eager. They're, you know, and, and I'm making generalizations, but their yeah. motivation can be around professional development, professional growth. You take someone who's middle aged and, you know, they're thinking, OK, I've got another 15, 20 years to go. I, have you know, have some lifestyle changes that I want to pursue. And you've also got people who are near the end of their mm -hmm. career and they're, you know, some of them are holding on, like, I just need to make it to retirement. So how those three different individuals approach attending a training is very different. And you're doing yourself, employers are doing themselves a disservice if they're not acknowledging that. Yes. And as I was joking a moment ago, I you have to recognize that kind of mandated trainings where you're pulling everyone in, you you better have a really good reason and purpose behind it. Yes. It better be really well designed. Um, yeah. So it's worth people's time. Yeah. And that may sound obvious and it may sound like, oh, well, of course that's the case, but we both know that that's not the case <laughs> often, like probably most of the time. Right, right. You know, the other part of that is I found that when people you know, they're planning their training and they start talking about, well, I want it to be 
engaging and exciting and get, you know, rah, 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 build morale, they, they engage in this practice of entertainment. Yeah. And I, it, I, oh, I, I get really bothered by that, but I, I encourage people that move away from the entertainment and focus on engagement. They are not the same thing. And if you really want people to stay committed and interested and focused and actually recognize that the training supports aligns with their values, you have to focus on who they are and use that to engage them. But we've all, we all have been to some type of training where the approach was, we're going to bring in this good name to rah, 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 bring in a celebrity. And that's, it is entertainment, but there's, there's very little application of that information being put in place and definitely not long-term. Nobody wants to sit through boring training. So you're, you're not <laughs> suggesting that, you know, we, we go to the other end of the spectrum and say, you know, go from just complete pure entertainment to like just boring lecture. Nobody wants that. No but one not saying, want, no. <laughs> no. Nobody wants that. But but right. it's the acknowledgement that the pure entertainment is not necessarily going to get you where you want to go uh, in terms of skill development, right? So if, right. if you've identified a skills gap and you're trying to address that skills gap, that means there is actual learning that has right. to happen. There are, right. there's actual information, there's content, there's actual skill development that has to occur, application that has to occur. And, and just having someone come in and tell fun stories and who's entertaining and whatever, uh, while it might be insp even inspirational or motivational, it, it's not going to, to, to fill the gap, fill the gap that you yeah. have to do. And, and so that engagement piece, it, it means, yes, you can still have entertaining content, but it has to be done in such a way that it's meeting the goals and objectives of the training program. And that happens through engagement. That happens through involving people in the process of their learning so they can own their learning process. So they right. can take responsibility right. for what they're being asked to learn uh, and being shown and scaffolded, like shown a way that they can, can accomplish it. Absolutely. And it's not, you know... I'm I'm picturing myself listening to you and I have this conversation and I think it can appear that this is an easy lift. This isn't an, an easy thing to do. Of course, these are the gaps that we want to fill and these are the goal, the learning goals and learning objectives. But when it comes down to it, it's it can be a heavy lift if this is a new transition. The other part of it is, excuse me, is thinking about it from a development perspective. So who's developing the experience of learning? And I like to refer to it as a learning experience. Um, and then the other part of it is the facilitation. So who in fact is facilitating this? How are they facilitating it? Because what I have found is when we think of the word mandatory training, right. whether it's the employee or the individual facilitating it, there's this expectation or this mental model of this is going to be boring, it's going to be mundane, we just have to power through, when the reality is, is we can still have a mandatory annual training, but, but done, so developed and facilitated through a different lens, it can truly prove to be meaningful fill gaps, build new skills, and and achieve long-term outcomes. It is it is truly in going back, starting with the individual. So who is the end user? Mm -hmm. Doing a deep dive there, building the content. And lastly, which I'm, I always propose, is you have to support people and build their confidence in applying the information. Because again, that's that's the last part of it or a final part of it is, yes, we've got them engaged and they're motivated. We've built this well-designed program and then it stops there. Well, if people have a clear understanding, they don't know, you know, it's questionable whether or not they know how to apply that information and that skill set, as well as make decisions 
as circumstances change. So if I'm in a leadership development program and we're only talking about it from this one perspective and I go off and I do my job, I'm applying all the skills. But if we then have an executive change and the culture of our organization changes, am I skilled enough? Have I developed those leadership skills to make a transfer to this new circumstance? And that is without fail where it gets lost oftentimes. If that engagement is there, if the development of the content is there, it's that oftentimes I see there's a lack of supporting people in skill development. Yeah, that ongoing skill development and application is key. Um, you said something else I just want to hone in on for a second. Again, yeah. it probably sounds obvious to everyone and probably everyone's thinking, well, of course we're going to do this, but you have to start with clear objectives. So if you've identified a skills gap, you have to then establish clear objectives connected to individuals. And that means fundamentally, and 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 thankfully we have you know, more and more technology that that helps facilitate this, but we need to have at least some level of personalization available mm -hmm. in the learning process for yeah. adult learners, because yeah. everyone does, they're not a blank slate. They are coming from different points. Uh, they have different background. They have different experiences. They have different roles. They are different yeah. life stages, different career stages. Like it, the, the idea that we can just like have this prepackaged thing that we just have people show up to and then they just do it. And then all of a sudden, voila, you know, we're going to have a change in behavior or a change in performance. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of comical that, that we kind of yeah. think that yet that's, that's whether people think that or not, that's kind of the practice. That's how it often it happens within organizations. It and is. so having, having a more clear kind of set of objectives that align directly to individuals that account for and provide flexibility for difference. Uh, in individual circumstances and the needs of individuals that can like, that may sound like that's not possible, but no, that really is. We're, we're educators. Like you right. can do that. You can create a, a course, you can create learning modules, you can create individual standalone trainings that allow for, for that kind of individualized um, learning and application to meet the gaps that may be, you know, challenging to your organization. Uh, and so if, you know, people who are watching or listening, if you're like nodding along, you're like, of course, we need to do that. So then I guess the question is, well, if people recognize that, why doesn't it happen? What what can we do within organizations to to really champion the type of adult learning strategies that you're suggesting so that we can have meaningful, impactful learning and development offerings uh, to help reskill and upskill our people, you know, so we can do cool stuff so people can fill like they're empowered and fulfilled in the work that they do. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, you know, I think when we, when we give consideration to developing a training, it happened, there are a couple reasons that it gets developed. It's reactionary. Mm -hmm. And so typically if it's reactionary, it's often done very quickly. And so if it's done, if it's developed quickly, there often isn't that focus or prioritization of the individual, the, the end user, right? It's really of, we either need to prove that we address this problem or this mistake, whatever the case may be, or we have to fix this. So there's, I think that's part of it, you know, so it's the objectives aren't always at the top of the list. The other part is when we have individuals who are end up being the ones to facilitate a training many times they are also doing other things so in the case of we've got an annual um, training that we have to get everyone through in order to re, you know maintain our credentialing if those facilitators or those developers have been working on other projects all year and we're in the fourth or end of third quarter fourth quarter end of year, there's so much that they are trying to balance again. Oh yes. Let me, you know, give some attention to who the end users are and develop these well-structured objectives to support it. That it often falls 
lower and lower on the on the list of priorities. And, and so that's something that I, I try to help people understand is that what is the reason this training has been developed? And even mm-hmm. if it's because there's a skills gap, how did you become aware of the skills gap? What did a mistake happen? Was there a loss of revenue or a, a significant decrease in um, generating revenue? And so again, the training is reactive to the marketplace or was there a change in the organizational structure that mandates, you know, again, it's those, those reactions um, to developing a training. It's critical. It is critical. So yes, it's a lot of, we are having a very basic conversation about fundamentals, but as we all know, when work gets busy, the fundamentals sometimes go away and that's what becomes our practice. It's not relying on the fundamentals. You know, we're living in this world of AI and we just are. And so there's this expectation for a lot of people is you need to get up to speed. You need to allow AI to do the work. I'm an advocate of no, that has its place, but that should not be the default. You still need to understand the individuals. And the way to understand people is to have conversation with them, engage with them. That's how you understand where they are. It's not simply looking at a list of what are the titles that need to go through this training. Um, And so it's, yes, we need to revisit the basics, but also considering the fundamental insights don't always happen. Another thing that I wanted to share with along those same lines, which I've never understood, and and John, I'm hoping, giving your background, you can explain this to me, budgets. (laughs) The the budget, the budget, right? So yes, we we are going to line item X amount for training and development as the year goes on. We got to pull money from someplace. Well, that's where we're going to pull it from. Yeah. And, and I'm always amazed at organizations that say, we value our employees or we value our volunteers, but yet their training and development program does not reflect that you value the people. It yeah. does. So often I, I've seen that. So can you explain to me why? why I oh, think I, I think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a bigger conversation, but I think I think there's a variety of reasons, but ultimately I think it comes down to partly what you just said, like the fundamentals of putting together good trainings. It's not like rocket science. Like it, yeah. you can do it. Like, the, so, so I think we've all sat through really terrible trainings of yeah. people who consider themselves to be really great trainers. <laughs> and so like everyone thinks they can do training and, and you just can't, uh, can everyone learn how to do training? Probably. And, and learn how to do it well, probably, but just like anything else, it's a skill and you have to devote time to it and energy and resources to it. And so I, I think far too often, you know, uh, an organization and leaders, you know, when there's a pinch with budgets, they, it's one of the first things to go and they think, oh, well, this person, they, they, they like people, they like talking, they like being in front of people. We'll, we'll make them a trainer and maybe they can be great, but that doesn't, I mean, there's so much that goes into designing and structuring a really great learning and development program and trainings that actually fill gaps and, and accomplish the objectives that you want to accomplish. That's, it's not like rocket science, but it also isn't easy. It takes time right. and intentionality. And I think just like many things in business, a lot of times the simple things that need to happen consistently to be successful don't happen because right. you're putting out fires, because you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, trying to meet whatever the demand of the day is. And and things like training are seen as dispensable um, or they're seen as, oh, anyone can kind of do that. And the reality is it's, it's you just can't. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, that, that last point reminds me of, um, the idea or the practice that so-and-so has been doing the job for so long. We'll have, we'll move them over to being a trainer. It's such a mistake. It's not a, 
you know, unless that individual says, I'd like to step into this role and I'm ready to learn some facilitation skills, that's one thing. But to simply put an individual in yeah. that role, it, it's a bad decision. And it reminds me of a case last year, I was um, hired as a consultant for this state level organization. And I sat through, it was social services. And so I sat through one of their trainings of new hires on how they were training people with the system. And I'm sitting in the back and I'm like, I don't understand. I have no clue how to log into the system based on what they're saying. I mean, they've got, everyone has a computer. The attendees are looking around asking each other, how do I do this? The facilitator is moving through rep, like rapid fire. Oh, don't worry about that. I know it keeps showing up on the screen, but don't worry about it. It's not important. And I asked at one point, you know, we were taking a break. I just went up and I said, I'm just curious, how long have you been in training? Well, I've been a trainer for five years, but I've been doing the job for 20. And so, you know, I was I, I was a good choice in, in doing the training. And I thought, oh, okay, you know, very polite. I, I don't ever want to disparage anyone. But I just, I sat back down and I thought, what a bad decision. It's just bad. There's no polite way to say that because not only do you set that workforce up for burnout and, and not being successful, but you've also set up the trainer or the facilitator for burnout and not and frustration and not doing well. And so it's, you know, it goes back to that, your point about the budgeting, there's, it's the simple things that we have to do and, and do them consistent, consistently that matter, but it just doesn't get done. Yeah. Carrie, well said. This has just been a fun conversation. And I think we could go on for a really long time, yeah. but I also note the time and I need to let you go here and get on with your busy day. Before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, um, I I invite people to connect with me on LinkedIn, Dr. Carrie Graham. I'm also, my website is drcarriegram.com as well, but for live conversations, let's let's chat on LinkedIn. Um, the final thought is it, it training is not about the content. It's not about you. It's about the learner. I love it. Perfect. That's a perfect way to end. <laughs> Thank you so much. Again, it's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Carrie can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you stay healthy and safe and please join us again soon.